everyone. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome back to Build. Masterpiece on PBS is bringing Victor Hugo's classic novel, Les Miserables, to viewers in a six part drama starring Dominic West, David Oyelowo, and Lily Collins. This adaptation of Les Mis is beautiful, packed full of drama, and provides an intimate look into the lives of its iconic characters. Take a look. <sighs> You look like an angel. I'm utterly at your mercy. I don't believe you. Let me prove it. The ground we walk on, we could fall through at any time and no one would care. But why should it always be like that? Because it is. Whatever you think, you can never win. So Valjean, you don't think it possible that kindness and love can change a man? Oh, Cosette, whatever are we going to do now? <laughs> Your little darling won't for nothing in our loving care. Child should be able to play now and then, especially at Christmas. Oh, and some people should learn to mind their own business. You don't know what the world is like. But I want to see for myself. Paris is a tinderbox. It'll only take a spark to set it off. Please put your hands together for Lily Collins, David Oyelowo, and Dominic West. How are you guys doing today? Very well, thank you. Great. I feel like you're excited. You're sitting on the edge of your seat. Like, I am on the edge of my seat. Can't wait to talk about Les Mis. It looks so gripping, the show. <laughs> but it really is. I was telling you guys in the back, this is a six-part series. I got to watch the first three, and I was just really transported. So I just want to applaud all of you for the work, because it really was a special thing to watch. I was really familiar with Les Mis, the musical, but this is based off of the the novel, and you really get a deeper look into it. So is that what drew you guys to the project? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I was first approached about it, you think, oh, okay, we've just had a really great film of, the, of Les Mis that's come out recently. What's the reason to do it again? And then I read Andrew Davies' um, six episodes adapted from the original 1,500-page uh, novel, and suddenly you see exactly why. So much context, so much layering. You really get into the history, the backdrop of post that French Revolution, and then these characters that we... Uh, are afforded the opportunity to play, you really, really get into the psychology of them and, and why they are who they are and what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Did you guys ever just sort of pray that they'd let you sing one song, though? <laughs> I was always trying to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, Lily, you were singing. Well, well my, our director kept on random days, you know, throwing in there saying, well, we might have you sing to Cosette today. Um, in this, you know, this French nursery rhyme, can you memorize it by filming? You know, and it would always be these little moments that um, he'd throw at me that we used, but I don't know if they ended up using it. I don't think we ended up using most of them. Hopefully not because they weren't good. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it was his way of kind of putting a little bit of, of music in there. But for me, I, I loved the fact that with ours, we got to take what would have been song lyrics and actually make them into an episode. So being able to see Fontaine fall in love, have a child, be wooed, yeah. Um, you got to really see that in episode one, whereas usually it's you see her at the beginning of the downfall. Yeah. Um, so you get to feel more empathy towards her storyline. You, you really root for her, and you feel even more sad when she falls. I think that's what really I took away from Fontaine specifically is that I felt so much worse for her watching this than I have previously because there is that, that backstory, and you kind of see how she really did fall, whereas you maybe assume it when you maybe watch the musical, but you can actually see it. Um, so how did that change how you approached her from the beginning to the end? Well, we shot out of sequence for my character, so my second day of filming was my death scene, um, and then I worked my way back to life by the summer. So we shot it from winter to summer. Um, so for me, being able to start at the end and really see where we were taking her, I, I was able to then go as far, yeah. you know, the opposite direction as possible to when she's happier so that we could create a really distinct um, journey for her mm -hmm. from one to the other. Um, so 
being able to show a more naive, innocent, fun, loving side of her was a gift because we've never really seen that side of her. And also it was the time that Tom told me to really implement just more of myself in the character because there was there were really no comparisons that people would be able to use as to what Fontaine should be like at that period of her life. So that was more freedom for me. I can't believe you shot the death scene on the second yeah. day. It's so... Um, it was you and I, like, in that... It's so yeah. heavy. It was, it was the first time was, we met, yeah. It was six o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, and it was minus five in this old manor house just outside Brussels, and I, I thought, oh, I can't be bothered to do this. And I came up, and, <laughs> and, and Lily's there giving it 110 in rehearsal, and yeah. suddenly, and it was only the first week, I think, or yeah. second week or something, and... Then uh, that was when it was watching Lily being giving it all that on the first sort of our, our first meeting that that uh, it, she sort of set the tone for how how much commitment was required and and that was uh, I th yeah it was an amazing yeah, performance. Yeah, a nice little like eye twitch thing. I, I was oh, like, this it was like a full, I that but it was like a full. I really thought that, you were that, dying. I was like, can somebody help her? Yeah, <laughs> I said to her, she was in the middle of this, and I said, God, how do you how do you know about the twitch thing? How do you get that? And it's that was that was brilliant. <laughs> It was Someone's really, it was really brilliant. Google, yeah. It was great. And you play Jean Viljean, and he is obviously one of the most like, iconic characters in history. But I love this um, extra layer of emotion we have with him. He's so much more heroic in this, I feel like, than maybe previous versions. Well, he, what, what you get, I suppose, because it's long form, is, is, is you get how uh, probably, I don't know, I haven't actually seen the musical, so I can't really compare it, but it, you, you do get how his transition from being an animalistic brute, brutalized prisoner in, in 20 years in prison, um, to, and then you get to see how he lets love and compassion into his life, and, and that's really what makes him heroic, is how he's constantly trying to overcome his bestial self to become um, his best self. Yeah. Come on, that's a good line. That What's, is. Ooh. It is. <laughs> What's cool about watching it on TV, too, is that you because of the camera, you get to see that conflict happening behind your eyes, and it makes it really riveting because you, you can see all the things he's battling yeah. throughout. Yeah, yeah, and he's, he's um, I mean, the interesting thing I found about him was that he, because I can never understand why he's constantly surrendering himself back to Javert. He's constantly wanting to go back to prison, and uh, partly because uh, he's being pursued and he wants an end of the chase, but I think there's also this sense, and what's interesting, what Victor Hugo anatomizes is this, psychology of someone who's been incarcerated who believes they don't belong anywhere else yeah. that they they're only they're only worthy of of prison and i think that's a something we can all relate to and that's that's incredibly a, a perceptive uh, observation of human nature and you had to uh, have quite the physical transformation from beginning to end as well the haircut in like the first two where it's really short and was that your Hair? Yeah, yeah. No, my whole performance like is based on the hair, hair style. And it, the, the hair it's a huge part everything. of the game. No, it's massive. No, I'm not joking. Yeah, it and is. we shot because we shot the first bits last, and also the death scene last for that very reason, so that I could cut all my hair off. And uh, or I didn't. Someone came at me. Wait, with luckily, a... it worked for you that way because they needed my long hair last, so I didn't cut my hair off. Really, I used the wig yeah. because my ending was my beginning was last, and your last was oh, last. Oh, your short hair was wig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, of course it was. It yes. didn't grow. <laughs> didn't grow that fast in like two months. No, but so you had to really do it. That was I was so impressed because the way that they cut it was like being hacked into your oh, yeah. skull, like you had the ball patches. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. Really, really intense. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, Jackie. No, it was. Uh, it was. Um, yeah, it was all about the hair. <laughs> I noticed it. And you play Javert, and uh, I want to know what you did to get into the psychology of this character because he is so bullish and, and just like one focus and how did you sort of get into him? Well, one of the things that people don't necessarily know, certainly from the musical and generally speaking, is that Javert himself was born in prison to criminal parents um, and now he's a prison guard on the opposite side to what his parents were and what his up upbringing was. And so he has a deep sense of self-loathing about his origins, and so that 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 sense of hatred for for where he came from, I think, is what he transposes onto Jean Valjean. He he somehow crystallizes that part of himself into this man, and therefore pursues him in order to destroy that part of himself. Um, and the reason why, by the end of the narrative, 
there is this sort of moral shift for Javert is that he realizes that no, things aren't as black and white as he thought. You know, Javert is very Old Testament in a sense, and Jean Valjean's story is one of re redemption, New Testament, if, if you like. And when he then realizes, no, this man is a good person, he is worthy of redemption, he has transcended his criminality, he realizes that the person he has to destroy is himself. And that is, is a, an incredibly complex psychological journey uh, to be afforded to play. And so that focus is to do with really self-destruction. Mm -hmm. and, and that was that's the thing that you, you need six hours to get into the head of that kind of just unwavering pursuit of another human being. And that's the beauty of having the six hours is that transformation happens and you really get to lean into it and it right. builds so gradually versus having to wrap everything up in 90 minutes. Right. Um, your two characters, uh, every scene with you guys is so tense mm -hmm. right. and so heightened. So what, so what kind of work did, did you guys do to, to build that? <laughs> you, you, you go. Um, well, uh, I mean, that was my first question, really, having read it, was, you know, what's, what's his problem with, uh, <laughs> with Valjean? Why, well, he's obsessed with him. What's, what's, yeah, yeah no, that, that, that was, uh, you do wonder what's, what's going on there. And, and David does give me a funny look when I strip naked in front of him. But other than that... Um, <laughs> Impossible not to. <laughs> yeah. but, Buttons of steel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I sort of... Uh, I, we got it by, well, through David, really. I, I, we were talking earlier how I, I was constantly trying to sort of be friendly with David, and, you know, like offset it. and say, hi, let's just go and go for a drink or you know, go to dinner. And he'd constantly say, oh, God, he's not even friendly, this guy, because we didn't know each other before. And it was only at the end when we went out and had this amazing night together in, in Cannes, I think it was. And uh, I said, God, we should have done this months ago. And he said, no, I, did, I was deliberately avoiding you. You know, I was deliberately trying not to. Well, he's incredibly funny and a really nice guy. And the last thing you want to do with someone who you're trying to kill is be joking with them just before you go for a take. Um, so, you know, but for, for me personally, I, I find it... I find it very useful to stay as much in the hemisphere of the character as I possibly can. And so in relation to both Dominic's character and Lily's character, there was a certain amount of distance that was useful to keep because I'm, I'm so Ooh, mean to them. So much makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he didn't like me. I did too. <laughs> no, that's actually, yeah, that makes just that good of an actor. Um, welcome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then Jean Valjean and Fantine, um, there was a new dynamic I sort of saw in watching. Is w There seemed to be more of a love or an attraction or so, sort of a sensitivity there that I didn't maybe pick up before. Was that something that was in, in the words in the, in the novel? I, I think it's, it, it's only really suggested in the novel, but, yeah. but the way Valjean is so gutted, is so distraught when she dies, and so set on saving her daughter, Cosette. You know, he has to have been in love with her. He has to have had this, and he doesn't understand love. He hasn't right. felt love for 20 years, he, he, and he doesn't feel worthy of it, so he can't make sense of it, but he, he definitely real, he, he definitely falls in love with her, and, and, um, and so I, I wanted to bring that out as much as possible, but but Lily was resistant to that as well. I don't know, no one wanted to love me at all. I feel like I feel like in order to have really gone on that trajectory, we would have needed like another episode to fully. I, I feel like touching upon it was necessary because we we had those discussions beforehand with Tom, you know, our director as well. But it it's so hard to do in such a short amount of time and. I think for at least Fontaine's character, we really needed to stress her and Felix and what that meant for the rest of her storyline, that at the point that she got to when she's having um, moments with Jean Valjean, it was a, a, a male figure who could actually believe in her. And I think someone that when he betrays her and fires her, it affects her more because she's had this Felix experience as well. So it's... Um, she values her relationship with him so much, but I feel like we didn't we didn't get to explore it to the extent that I think we were maybe thinking we would, but you would need more time. You can't just throw that in there in a way that makes people confused because <laughs> um, you need time to, to really dive into it, I think. Even so, hinting at it, I think, builds that same sadness on the other yeah, side. There's more at stake. Yeah. And, and you 
feel, I think, another level of empathy for her. It's like she can't catch a break with any guy, really, until the very end when he does promise to to help her. But when she's dead, it, when <laughs> she's dead, I get, I get I know. to whisper in her corpse's ear. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a little a little too late. But that's also what this really afforded us as 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 actors. You know, when you read that book, it's a fifteen hundred page book. There's a lot of detail that Hugo, Victor Hugo, goes into, and this brilliant adaptation that Andrew Davies did, boiling it down to its essence in over six hours, just gave us so much opportunity. I mean, the the stuff you see in Fontaine that you just never get to see. In, in, the, in the musical. I think it's pretty difficult to just call Javert a villain when you see this because there are moments you have empathy for him because you see the backdrop against which he is operating and the way he's operating. And of course, with Jean Valjean, that incredible sweep of redemption, you see a man who just cannot entertain the idea of of being forgiven, and then the interaction he has with the amazing Derek Jacobi, who plays the priest in it, who opens his eyes up to the idea of redemption, which then goes on to inform so many other uh, interactions he has going forward. You just can't do that in two hours. And so, you know, even though there were, there were moments we, we couldn't go as deep as the novel, we certainly got to really go way deeper than, than most iterations of this you'll get to see. Are there any dynamics or storylines that are in the book that you read that you're like, oh, maybe that could have been cool or would have added something to... I mean, they can't put in everything, but... No, I mean, you really can't. There's, there's, there's four chapters just on the Paris sewers, you know, and, and they're actually quite good chapters. They're you know, quite interesting. There's a, there's a great scene where um, uh, Valjean, uh, in order to uh, escape escape him again, Javert again, from the, he gets buried in a coffin underground, uh, in the ground for a few hours before they dig him up and, and I sort of missed that, but you know, you can't You missed that? Well, like as an actor, yeah. you're volunteering yeah. for that? Yeah. That would be the first thing I'd want out <laughs> of, the, of the story. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So I know one of the obstacles in filming this was the weather. Can we talk about that a little bit? You guys filmed in Brussels mm -hmm. in the winter. Yeah, the when do, when do, well, we started in minus four and ended in boiling hot, didn't we? It so was we not minus four. No, the day that we were doing the scene with all three of us and I was being tossed around was like minus 13. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was really cold. And, and you I was wearing this sheer. I was wearing very limited clothing, uh, you know, and so I couldn't really put warming clothes underneath because yeah. it's like I was if I was falling a certain way and we had to ruin the take because I was wearing like pants underneath that would have been really I, frustrating. I remember you wearing a very heavy cloak because I had to carry I had to carry <laughs> <laughs> I think that was in rehearsal. Heavier than she looked. That was in rehearsals because I was 100% wearing very little. I, yeah, I remember that because there was a was it wet? So that, that scene, it was wet because oh. it was it had been snowing for real, and then it melted and made everything very wet. And then I'm on the ground most of the shot, so I'm very wet. Like everything was like heavy and wet. And then I remember it was very very late at night, and it was just a painful scene to shoot for many reasons. And um, at one point, he does lift me up, and we were walking away. I'll never forget this. Endless we were take. The, the endless take, because it, he had to then walk up, being the strongest man alive, up this, like, cobblestone, like, you know, high street. And I remember we were still rolling. There was still, you know, and you just go, oh, God, can you not make this easier on me? Like, <laughs> you are a dead weight. And I was like, you don't understand the pain that I'm in right now. Like, we just need to yell cut, and then I'll explain everything. But it was so funny, because even in the shot, we're like, I'm dead. And he's like, please make this easier on me. <laughs> and this is after, in that same scene, I had accidentally... I wasn't going to say it, but... ...thrown Lily across the cobble stones and she had whacked her hip and got this giant bruise they use the tape um, they use the it's tape. a mid shot it was worth you can it. tell that it's me you'll, you'll see go like whew, and i just go Wee, like and then I land remember, on the car and then you hear me yeah. scream and the scream i actually almost swore but then i thought oh you can't do that because i can't use it yeah. so then i just it's it's real yeah. So I evidently am so strong that so I can fling Lily. Meanwhile, he's going, please help up. me, please. How heavy is this cloak? <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't wearing a cloak. I, was, I wish I was wearing a cloak. <laughs> well, I know our audience has a couple of questions for you guys before we get out of here. Uh, who do we have first? Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to meet you guys. And my question goes out to this lovely lady right there. Hello. Hello. Oh, what do you find fascinating about the Victor Hugo character you're portraying? Um, for me, I found it fascinating that throughout all of the 
death and destruction and turmoil that she does experience on her journey, she remains so determined and passionate for her daughter, and she's willing to put her moral her moral compass aside at times, like her self worth. She she values her daughter more than she values her self worth. Sometimes, you know, when she ends up having to sell herself to make money for her daughter. Um, she puts herself at risk for someone else. And that, that love and that strength and that determination was really inspiring to me. And it's something that, as a future mother, I would love to be able to emulate, you know, that, that determination for her daughter. I'm curious, um, were there any hesitations for any of you in taking on such iconic characters? I mean, do you just create your own performance or do you go back and watch some of the most famous performances of your characters? How do you kind of handle that part of it? Tom didn't really want us doing that. I mean, he mentioned not that it wasn't stress. Yeah. He didn't want, necess- at least for me, he said, I don't want you necessarily to go rewatch right. the film. Don't rewatch the musical. Look at the text. Yeah. Generally, that- generally, that's, I think, a bad idea. Um, I mean, you, you may have seen something before you got the role, and I'd certainly seen other iterations of, of Javert, but uh, for me, the book is so detailed. You know, I, I've, I've actually never done uh, a project where pretty much all of my research was boiled down to one piece of material which was the book because Hugo had done such a great job of painting these 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 characters in a sense so um yeah I sort of had all I needed um what was the question sorry <laughs> did you look at any of the other Jean Vildes oh I did yeah no I did but not for very long <laughs> yeah I uh, I we, had, we, we had just been talking about then. this before we but, came on <laughs> You're, mercifully, you're having a geriatric mercifully moment, I, right? I haven't seen the musical yet, although it's coming out again, so I'm going to watch it then. But And I hadn't really seen all of the film, so I, I, I came to it fairly fresh, although I did say, why the hell do we want to make this again? You know, they've obviously just made a film. But then you read the book, and you read it for those reasons that we've said. Um, so I did, and then I watched, then I watched um, Liam Neeson. Do, it's not helpful seeing other people. And the point about these great classic roles, these great parts, is that they can take any number of interpretations you know a, a smaller smaller part that's you know uh, you know there's only one way of looking at it but with these things anyone can play uh, hamlet or or valjean or, you know any of these they're such great roles that and that's why they're for all time and they will be played for all time because they have they have resonance and and victor hugo said so long as there is poverty in the world this story will have re- re- relevance and and resonance and it certainly does and i think people react to it in a in, an, in a very visceral, profound way in every generation. And there are therefore actors in every generation who will play them. I don't think just anyone could play Jean Valjean the way he does. I mean, I you are brilliant. Well, thank you very much. But yeah. <laughs> when, when I mentioned the like watching the stuff behind your eyes, I don't think a lot of people can just do that. So. Right. Thank um, you. Next one. Hi. Um, uh, oh my God, I can't talk. Sorry about that. Um, for you guys to embody the characters, what, uh, where did you guys take inspiration from besides the novel? Inspiration besides the novel. Um, well, for me personally, in playing Javert, um, it was it was actually looking at when you when you read the the book, it's very biblical in scope, and it really looks at morality how, you know, religiosity, and I mean the difference between religion and faith. And so I really was inspired by the notion of the New Testament, which is, which can be about um, redemption and faith and all of that, that being Jean Valjean, and then the Old Testament, which is about the law and black and white and condemnation, damnation, you know, and that being where, for whatever reason, Javert felt comfortable. Um, so you, th- that really helped me, you know, um, traverse my way through the narrative, being someone who is very comfortable with judgment. And also avoiding Dominic when he asks you to go for drinks. Help. Yeah, yeah, which is where the judgment comes <laughs> in. <laughs> we have a couple Twitter questions. Millie CO5 wants to know, or Millie CO5 wants to know, Lily, if you could describe your character uh, in just one word, what would it be? It will have. I'll. I'll need to explain why this one word. But um, light, 
And I think because she serves as such a light throughout the series mm. um, in a time of darkness and that even within her own time of darkness, she still kept the inner light for herself and for her daughter. Definitely. That's an answer within three seconds of, you know, if I had more time to think, it might be a different But word, I like that. That was deep. You, you can't know. put out a light. Like, a flame, exactly. flame, flame goes forever. I like yeah. that. All right. Next one. Uh, if you could compare Les Mis to a dark fairy tale, what do you think it would be? That was uh, for Lily, but for all of oh. you. Is it well, like I'll any other sort of dark? Um, to a dark fairy Well, I would actually, mm, in terms of fairy tale, can I say, like, is... is um, um, the Little Mermaid <laughs> isn't that dark, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to go with The Little Mermaid off the top of my head because Ariel wanted to be part of that world, and she wanted to see all the glitz and the glam and what she thought she wanted. You know, she wanted legs. She wanted to live that life that she thought she did, and the second that she meets someone, she thinks that that's going to be the, her her ticket there. And um, Fontaine, I was going to say Lily, Fontaine, um, wants to be part of that upper echelon of society and she meets this man, Felix, that she thinks, wait, isn't Felix also the name of the prince? No. No, Eric. Oh, Eric. <laughs> I'm like, is it I Prince like, Felix? It? No, I, I, I was testing you, obviously. <laughs> oh, um, I know my Disney. Okay. Not, just kidding. Um, but, but yeah, she, she then falls into a trap as well where she kind of has it and then doesn't. That's a good comparison. And I think it's one of those things that just makes Les Mis so iconic is that it holds up. It, these same themes that he explored when he wrote it we're still examining today. And like you said, each new generation of actors gets to bring it to life in their own way. And you guys did a magnificent job. I enjoyed the ride. I have three more episodes left, which I will finish tonight. Um, so if you guys want to check out Les Mis Rob, it airs on Masterpiece PBS, Sunday, April 14th at 9, 8 central. Give it up for Lily Collins, David O'Yellowell, and Dominic West. Thank you. 